In the next few units, we will be studying electromagnetism. The earliest record of electromagnetism was probably the discovery in 600 BC by Greek philosophers that a rubbed piece of amber would attract little pieces of dry leaves. The Greek philosophers also discovered magnetic stones that could attract pieces of iron. Electricity and magnetism developed separately for centuries, until 1820, when a scientist discovered a connection between the two. Hence the name electromagnetism. We will now start with static electricity. After people test rubbed different materials and studied the forces between these objects, they found two kinds of charges. Like charges repel, while unlike charges attract each other. We call the kind of charge a glass rod carries after rubbed with silk positive, and the kind of charge an amber rod carries after rubbed with wool negative because Benjamin Franklin said so. Because Franklin decided to name the two kinds of charges that way, we end up having electrons carry negative charges while protons carry positive charges. By the way, this is not really an amber rod, it's just some sort of plastic resin. When we rub this rod to make it carry a charge, we mean to have it carry a net charge, because everything has charged particles inside. When it is neutral, it has equal number of positively charged protons and negatively charged electrons. When I rub it with wool, some electrons on the wool move on to the resin rod because this plastic attracts electrons more than the wool. Therefore, the resin rod ends up with excessive electrons and carries a net negative charge. Now I can use this negatively charged rod to attract these little pieces of paper. Since the negatively charged rod attracts the little piece of paper, what kind of charge do you think these little pieces of paper carry? Are the pieces of paper positively charged? Let's give this positively charged glass rod a try and see if it repels the paper. No, it attracts the paper too. So what can you say about the charges on these little pieces of paper? They are neutral. But why would the charged rod attract the neutral paper? Let's say this is the negatively charged rod and this is a little piece of paper. Paper is an electric insulator. Oh, what is the difference between an electric insulator and an electric conductor? An electric conductor allows charges to flow through it while an insulator does not. A metal is a conductor. And which kind of charges can flow through a metal? Free electrons are the ones that can move around in a metal. They are the valence electrons, not the electrons on the inner shells. Salt water is also a conductor. What kind of charges can move in salt water? the positive and negative ions. Since paper is an insulator, charges cannot move through paper. However, within a molecule, the electron cloud can still shift around. So within a molecule, the electrons can get repelled by the negative charges on the rod and uh, the molecules would become like this. And this is called uh, polarization. The negatively charged rod attracts the positive charges and repels the negative ones. What kind of net electric force do we end with, and why?
because the positive charges are closer to the rod, the negative charges are farther away from the rod. So the attractive force between the opposite charges is stronger than the repulsive force. Therefore, the net electric force between the two is attractive. So even though the paper is neutral, the negatively charged rod was still attracted. Now let's consider water instead of paper over here. Because the water already has polar molecules, this charge separation is even larger, which means that we end up with the even stronger net attractive force. So here I have this uh, negatively charged rod. And I bring it close to water. See it bends water. What if instead of little pieces of paper or water, I have a conducting material such as pieces of metal foil? Since uh, there are free electrons that can flow inside this metal foil, the free electrons can get repelled by the negatively charged rod and move to the opposite side, leaving positive charges on this side. This is called induced charge separation. This means we should have strong attractive force between the rod and the neutral foil. So this is an aluminum foil. As you could see, the foil pieces did jump pretty high when attracted by the charged rod. It may be even more obvious when we look at these graphite coated pith balls. Pith is a very light plant material, kind of like styrofoam. These pith balls are coated with graphite. Why graphite? What's special about graphite? Graphite is an electrical conductor, so this coating provides a conducting surface. Let's see what happens when I bring this negatively charged rod in. At first, the rod attracted the pith balls, but when the balls touched the rod, because of the conducting graphite surface, the pith balls acquire negative charges from the rod, so they immediately begin to repel the rod. Notice that the two pith balls, both carrying negative charges, repel each other as well. Now, I can remove the net charges on the pith balls by touching them. This is called grounding. See, the charges are removed and the two, two pith balls no longer repel each other. When I ground a charged conductor, I connect the object to a much bigger conductor. I am like a big bag of salt water. So I am a conductor and I am a much bigger conductor than the pith balls. When I touch the pith balls, the excessive electrons on the pith balls flow to me. Since I'm so much bigger, I can virtually stay neutral even after taking these excessive charges. In case if I need to ground something bigger, I will need to connect that thing to an even bigger conductor. And guess what the biggest available conductor is? It's the Earth. That's why we call it grounding, connecting things to the actual ground. Take a look at an electric plug. The round prong here is the grounding. If the electrician who put in the wiring for your house did the job correctly, all of those round holes at your normal outlets are connected to the ground. I mean the earth ground. I have this outlet tester here. When it lights up like this, it means uh, everything is done right. See? Same. Of course, I'm the one who put in all the wiring in my basement. See, I can touch the grounding. This is a metal nail, and I'm just fine. Well, please don't do it at home unless if you know for sure that they are grounded correctly. All of those grounding wires from circuits in your house should be connected to some long metal rod that goes deep into the ground. This is what I have in my house. All of the grounding wires are connected to the water pipe that comes into the house and the supply the water we use because these copper pipes do go deep into the ground. When we ground an object, we draw the grounding like this in a diagram because it is like connecting to the ground.